This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us. With me today is John Cameron in the middle, Richard Fields down on the other end. And gentlemen, there's an issue coming up with uh, the FDA and lack of transparency with the specifically the Pfizer COVID vaccine data. The court has now asked for 75 years to produce the details on the COVID vaccine trial results. Now, we're supposed to trust these trial results. You know, we're not anti-vaxxers here. We're all for people who choose to get the vaccine, want to get the vaccine, should get it. But how are we supposed to trust something if they're saying, well, we're not going to give you the data for 75 years? That's not how science is done. Science is you create the data, you share the data so people can analyze it and find out if something's wrong. What's going on here? Huh? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. The, uh, the uh, plaintiff that filed the suit against the FDA under the Freedom of Information Act asked for the results, all of the, all of the, uh, the uh, information that uh, Pfizer submitted to the FDA, asked to receive it within 108 days, which coincidentally, and I'm sure not accidentally, uh, is the amount of time the FDA took to approve the FDA uh, vaccine. So 108 days to approve the, you know, to look over all of the data that Pfizer provided and approve the vaccine. And Pfizer, or now the FDA, is saying, well, initially they said we need 55 years to release all the information that was submitted to us by Pfizer. Uh, and uh, the 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 uh, people making the request appealed, and Pfizer came back and said, well, no. It needs to be 75 years now. So they basically just uh, <laughs> doubled down. And you, just, you have to ask. And I mean, not only that, but all the vaccine companies, Pfizer included, have uh, are, are shielded from liability if their vaccine should do or have some uh, serious side effects. So it's it's, it's, it's a very, a very, very suspicious set of circumstances. You have to ask, why do they need 75 years to produce the information that the FDA uh, reviewed in 108 days? So that's that's Pfizer that needs 75 years, or that's the FDA needs 75 years? Pfizer. Fi, well, to, to, Pfizer and the FDA. I think it's the FDA that's, that's refusing. Well, uh, then, then it makes complete but, sense. Well, no. Because the, the FDA is a government agency, and they pretend to read a study in, in uh, 108 days, but they can't, they know they can't accurate, or they can't comprehensively fudge all the data to justify their decision without taking about 75 years to do it. So uh, I don't, you know, in, in uh, I think it's New Zealand and Australia, maybe it's New Zealand or Australia, and I, I could be speaking out of my hat here, so bear with me. Uh, the the uh, vaccine makers are not shielded from lawsuits, and there's something like 10,000 uh, actions uh, because of side effects, uh, uh, the heart inflammation and other things that are going on. Uh, pending in whatever country it is now. I'll look it up for the next show. But anyway, so we we decided to, to I guess, shield vaccine makers here, and the government assumes liability. Uh, but in, in other countries, apparently that's not the case. So uh, I don't know the ins and outs of it. But I find it, um, it's either uh, um, scurrilous, it's either uh, they're, they're hiding something, or they're completely incompetent, or my choice government agency both yeah so it just it's it's another reason why any association between an independent regulatory agency and and the uh, the uh, companies they favor is uh, is uh, laughably wrong and in a nice libertarian world it wouldn't exist so yeah yeah it's, it's strange that normally this kind of thing 55 years it's kind of used for national security reasons well what the hell could national security reasons could be this Pfizer data be? What is well, the it might, it might to, to, to forestall uh, an act of uh, civil war? Uh, you know, who knows? Hmm. Yeah, it, it's just it's outright. It, it is really outrageous about this this fifty five year thing. It's it's stunning. But hmm. speaking of outrageous, we're going to go here to uh, inside California politics here a minute. Um, Oakland Mayor Libby Schiff has uh, 
or plans on helping to fix the violence in uh, Oakland, right? They've now decided that we get all those cops and defund the police things. Now we've got to reverse all that. Now we have to go back and hire all those cops again. We have to crack down on. So essentially all this nonsense that they've spent the last two years, three years, however long it's been in the Bay Area, now at a decade now, I suppose, is now all coming apart at the seams. And now all of a sudden they're having to backtrack because I guess her career is more important than her values. I don't know what the heck is going on down there. Well, the money quote is that uh, it used to be the, uh, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the meme was defund the police uh, and take the money that you're spending on police and spending on, uh, spend it on intervention and uh, prevention, and et cetera. Now, the mayor of Oakland is saying, well, no, never mind. Don't defund the police. Uh, continue to spend the money that you would spend, spend on defunding the police. Spend that anyway on prevention and deterrence and whatever, but add more money so that we uh, can continue to crack down on violent crime. She's trying to have it both ways. What a surprise that uh, a uh, uh, a politician would want would would come up with a solution to all of her constituency's problems by throwing more money at them. Yeah, I I'm not shocked by that at all. What I'm what I'm uh, and I'm not shocked by this either. I'm I'm uh, disgusted by the lack of mea culpas because this. Uh, you know, all these organizations, all these um, socialist leaning cities that decided to let uh, rioters uh, run rampant and destroy private property and all the rest and didn't arrest any of them. Um, uh, there's no, gosh, we're sorry, Mr. Mom and Pop store that burned down. Gosh, we're sorry, you know, uh, citizenry that, that didn't feel safe shopping that still won't go into those districts. Gosh, we're sorry for the eyesore. We made a mistake and should have prevented the looting, all the rest of that. None of that is happening. They're just just stepping by that and looking away so nobody calls them on it and then doing uh, what they should have been doing all along, which is, is protecting property and protecting people's lives because that's really the only thing that we have a government for anyway or one of the few, very few things, which is protects people's property and protect their lives. And they, they failed miserably um, in, in that, uh, that duty and, and uh, they're, they're not taking any accountability for it. So that, that upsets me. It doesn't surprise me, but it upsets me. Yeah. Well, I don't think that this defund the police movement actually has anything to do with this recent rise in crime. I think this, the dehumanization of society in the last couple of years has, is the clearly the, the underlying cause you can, you know, police aren't responding, don't respond. All that stuff comes and goes, ebbs and flows. It's this dehumanization that we've had. No one respects property or people anymore, right? Mm -hmm. If you can, and we'll cover this about the abortion law, it kind of comes to the, the fight over abortion versus vaccine mandates. We don't respect other people anymore, right? We, we are continually um, wanting to in, inject our views on other people's bodies. Whether it's for abortion rights, like we have the Texas abortion issues coming up in, in, in the Supreme Court, which Newsom is going to take advantage of. I think he said if they can do that for abortion now, Newsom wants to do it for guns. He says we'll use the same process to go around the Second Amendment that they're going to use to go around, you know, buy my body, my choice. We're going to use it. So in a sense, we got politicians here looking for ways around basic human rights, what we consider, at least as libertarians, basic human rights. Well, the Bill of Rights, uh, you know, and, and in the case of, of abortion, uh, privacy rights, which is, you know, arguable, but uh, I'm not going to get into an, an argument uh, on whether abortion is good, bad, or indifferent. I support uh, women's right to abortion. I support Roe v. Wade personally. Uh, I can understand why uh, those who are against abortion, who consider it to be the murder of an unborn child, I can understand where they're coming from logically. Don't agree with them because I think that viability is the key, and that's the uh, test in Roe v. Wade. What Texas did is said, well, we're going to move the uh, the uh, the gauge for viability to a fetal heartbeat, which is not viability at all, uh, which is and is also about six weeks, which is also probably before most women even know they're pregnant. Uh, and we're going to uh, sublet the enforcement to private citizens to file civil lawsuits. 
thereby making it impossible for anybody to sue the state of Texas. Uh, they're, they're outsourcing enforcement of, of the law and making the law much more stringent. Gavin Newsom and, and the Supreme Court is looks like they're going to, you know, they're they're they're, they're letting us stand at least for the time being. Uh, who knows what, how it'll end up in the you know, ultimately, but if they do let it stand, they are opening up the door for Gavin Newsom to go after gun rights by essentially uh, deputizing uh, gun uh, enforcement laws that can't pass uh, a constitutional test to uh, to people to file lawsuits on. Uh, the same way with everything else in the Bill of Rights. We can, uh, libel rights, you know, if, if somebody uh, uh, says something nasty about somebody uh, under freedom of the press rules, they can do that under, uh, if you're going to get sued because of it, then maybe maybe not so much. So everything in the Bill of Rights is now at risk because uh, of the uh, Supreme Court, at least so far, waffling on the abortion case. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really uh, dangerous situation that we're in, in terms of uh, not just abortion and gun rights and freedom of speech, but all of our civil, civil liberties. They're all at risk. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole lot of politicians on both the left and the right that could care less about civil rights if it advances their careers. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree, and and when when that law was passed, uh, an awful lot of people, um, not an awful lot, a, a quite a few people who are normally in the uh, anti-abortion camp, uh, and um, you know believe firmly that uh, that uh, abortion is murder, were were deeply and seriously worried about the law because of the very things you're talking about, because it opens up. Uh, you know that the the, um, the ability of, of civil action by people who are upset about something that should be constitutionally protected, and and the the first one uh, mentioned was the you know right to bear arms, and uh, I I'm I'm I don't say I've lost all hope for the republic, but but it's a scary times we live in when when. Uh, you know, as libertarians, we want uh, we want to just to be left alone. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want to live live our own lives. And most of uh, of America, uh, most Americans want to be left alone to do whatever they want. The problem is they want to be in charge of everybody else's life. So, you know, that's why we have the Bill of Rights so that people can't make these you know stupid decisions to control other people's lives. And I'm I'm worried about it. So. You know, hopefully the the Supreme Court will. Uh, you know, the Roe v. Ray, the re the reason that so many people are upset about it from a legal perspective is just a crap piece of law. But you know, it's if if uh, that that can be fixed. But if they let this waffle happen, then everything, as Richard pointed out, that that we take for granted as right in this country is under attack by any lunatic that wants to file a civil suit. And we've got so many lawyers that uh, they're, they're just licking their chops over this. So, yeah, and I've been warning, I've been worrying about this for years that, you know, we've been giving up our body autonomy, willingly giving up our body autonomy, you know, and eventually it's going to come home to roost. Eventually we're going to give up so much of our body autonomy that we're not going to have any left and that the government will be able to do essentially whatever they want to us medically, whether it's restrict abortions or force an injection or anything in between. I mean, once you can do weed of the two, Anything is open, right? Once they can, once a, once the government or society has the right to dictate what goes on inside your body, the government has the right to dictate what goes on inside your body, and be well. And that's history has proven that be well. And talking about history, this one's for you, John. The countries with the cleanest environments have been found to be the <laughs> the most economically free. Now that doesn't surprise us because when you have extra money around, you have the ability to clean up your messes, but. We're going to leave this one for you, John. This is your little rant. You've been wanting this one for like two weeks now, so we left it for you. Well, I'm, I think based on that, I'm just going to rant the rest of the time away. You've, you've kind of poked my button. Um, so, uh, no, I'm, you know, I, I uh, unlike most people, I pay attention to Africa and, um, you know, the Hutu Tutsi thing and, and, uh, and all the rest of that. Uh, just bothered me to my core. But what really bothered me to my core, Richard and I both love the outdoors. We love wildlife. We love hiking. 
and and um, you know rhinoceros in this uh, in in Africa or near extinction, and a um, a group of people came up with a brilliant plan to uh, save rhinoceros. They just cut all their horns off, and so there was no reason for people to poach them. And rhinoceros started multiplying, and then busybodies, uh, primarily in the U.S. Um, uh, fought and bribed and all the rest of that and said it was cruel. So they stopped in some countries and some game preserves chopping off rhinoceros horns and they started poaching again. If you're somebody who's living on the bare edge, you have to walk a couple of miles to get hopefully safe drinking water. Uh, you're scrabbling for food and, and infant mortality is high and you can uh, feed your family for a, a year or two years or five years by killing a rhinoceros and cutting its horn off, you're going to do it. So that logic apparently has never entered into the, the Greens conversation about the environment. You know, if you're starving, you don't care about the environment. If you have money in, in stocks and bonds and you're living in a nice warm house, you have the means to care about the world around you and it becomes important. And, and uh, that is so logical that, uh, you know, I try to have conversation with these, these radical greens about it. And I say, oh, no, no, capitalism and, and, you know, the argument on global warming is the same thing. We need, to get rid of, we need to get rid of capitalism because capitalism is what's causing global warming. And it's, it's garbage that you, you line up the Yale study about the, the countries that do the best record uh, on the environment have the best record, have the cleanest water, the cleanest air, uh, that where species are, are, are thriving, that are endangered and wiped out in other places because they got pretty feathers that might sell for a dollar in a market somewhere. And the, the recent study of economic freedom, um, there's direct, what's that? Heritage study. That's heritage study. Thank you, Richard, there for giving me more fuel for my rant here. Um, there's a direct correlation. There's causation. You know, people who have means care. People who don't have means care about their next meal or their next safe water. And and how anybody can think that it works any other way is insane to me. And these, you know, the, the, the countries where capitalism doesn't exist uh, are their species are being wiped out left and right and they're, they're ecological and environmental disasters. And the countries where uh, where capitalism is the strongest, nature is being taken care of. And my rant's shorter. I just ran out of steam. So I yeah, you know, I think it's interesting if you take a look at the bar chart that compares uh, free country and you know, economically free countries, mostly free, somewhat free, uh, and I, I forget what the, the you know various gradations of freedom down to repressive. The correlation continues all the way down that uh, that uh, slope until you get to repressive if you're in a repressive economy i mean the very worst the the uh, north korea the places like that then you get less pollution i'm guessing it's because there's no economic activity going on at all you have to basically shut down the economies <clears throat> entirely before you have any benefits from uh from less uh, capitalism and of course that's what the left unstated goal, but that's what some of the more radical leftists want to do. They want to basically uh, shut down the economy, except for, of course, for their own uh, privileged circle. Mm. Yeah, they yeah. seem to think that nature is this nice, comfortable place where, you know, we all can sit around the campfire eating, singing kumbaya and eating s'mores or something without, without all this other stuff around us. It's not possible, you know. Mm history the human history was brutal cold brutal place it's not it's not like there was ever a time in human history where we got to sit around and eat strawberries blazing by the river it didn't happen i don't know what these these people live in like a disneyland cartoon i don't know what these people think the nature was they think nature is like disneyland cartoon or something everything gets they, they believe the ad, that the garden of eden actually existed uh, in real time or something yeah well, well, the problem with that thinking is that that it's carried over like the form to fork, 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 fork movement, and you know these small truck farms and everywhere. People don't realize that that the the uh, the environmental impact of you know the the uh, 
inefficiencies of scale is huge. Um, their, their efficiency of scale are real and they exist. And, you know, modern farming technology uh, is, uh, Richard could go on forever about this because he was, he is a farmer, was and is a farmer and has another farm now, or at least a farm one generation removed. And, and the, the modern farmers take much better care of the environment because they have the tools to do it than, you know, in the past, these pastoral farms they do pictures of with people planting crops by hand and, and you know, having a horse pull a harrow and all the rest of that. And, oh, that's the way farming should be. Yes, people died from exhaustion on those farms. And, and Not to mention they had to put up with a bunch of horse uh, manure. Yes, and, and their ideas are horse manure, and we can probably go on to the next subject. Yeah. Well, speaking of horse manure, there has been a poll recently by the Builders BFI, the Builders BIA, the Builders Institute Association. Um, Sacramento does not like the high home building fees we have here in Sacramento. And apparently here in Sacramento, we have a, our home building fees add on essentially $95,000 just off the top of, of a house from then, then other cities like in the Central Valley. Not just just a hundred thousand dollars more for the cost of your house, just off the top in fees than other places around the state here mm -hmm. in Sacramento, and we wonder why we don't have affordable housing. That's a hundred thousand dollars right off the top. Well, I, I James, I I don't see how you could you could be upset about our uh, efficient government taking a hundred thousand dollars and making Sacramento a virtual paradise. I mean, we, we have wonderful roads. We have fantastic schools. We have no homeless. Um, it's a garden of Eden here. Why? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We don't. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, the thing about government is that, you know, no matter how much money and power you give them, they're going to want more of both and they're going to accomplish uh, a whole lot uh, uh, less than private industry would do. So, um, you know, and I, I, I talked to this guy who's never going to watch the show. I'm not going to mention him by name, who's a developer. And he talks about how the, the problem with education in California is uh, because of the law that was passed limiting property taxes to uh, one and a half percent of, of value. And, and he said, and that's why, you know, teachers are underpaid and that's why you know, schools are falling apart and that's why, you know, students aren't, aren't being educated. No, that's not the reason. There, there's like $34 trillion being taxed now and, and the amount of money that schools have available, even accounting for inflation, has grown tremendously since uh, Jarvis. So um, it's, it's just horse pucky. It's just a way for people to... to uh, keep the riffraff that they they don't want from owning a house next door to them while they go and vote for some socialist lunatic to run the country it's uh you know it's it's racist and it's very very stark i think richard can talk a little bit about the you know zoning laws themselves were 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 you know basically created to to keep black people out of white neighborhoods so yeah yeah very explicitly so and uh uh you know that's that's history, but the zoning laws are still here, and uh, the uh, uh, NIMBY movement, uh, which originally was a racist movement, or has always, in, in many cases, was racist as far as its motivation is concerned. The NIMBY movement is still alive and well, and try to change the zoning law, try to change a uh, uh, a uh, a bond issue, a bond school bond issues almost always pass, and you end up with uh, public education costing. Uh, you know, two or three or four times as much as uh, equivalent, uh, better performing uh, private education. Mm -hmm. It's all because you throw money at a problem and you don't expect good results and you uh, get the bad results and lose the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's, it's kind of a strange thing because we've just I was just watching a KCRA thing on the unemployment development department. Thirty one billion dollars was wasted to fraud. In the unemployment, we have plenty of money. It's not like it's not like the governments are running around searching for money under cushions, right? We've, they're, they're doing too many things. They're wasting their money on administrative costs. They're mis misappropriating it or spending it unwisely, shall we say? Now you're talking about the state of California, obviously. Uh, 
which uh, well, Sacramento is uh, no different. Sacramento yeah, is the state it's, of California, the state, city of Sacramento. Uh, public education in general has plenty of money. Uh, federal government doesn't have enough money, but then they're spending uh, ungodly amounts more than they have, and they're. But then, of course, they have plenty of money too because the Fed just prints it up for them. Hmm. Yeah, this is, it's not an issue of money. I, this it's the artificially propped up the home prices so they can you know for one to keep people out but the second thing is it artificially creates the churn and it, you know there's no well, and, no and it, and, it, and, it, and it keeps the top one percent uh their assets continue to appreciate they're the people that own the mcmansions they're the people that own the uh, uh estates they're the people who uh very much benefit when property prices skyrocket it's not the uh, it's not the people that don't own a home that benefit when uh, property prices go up no, no. So we complain about gentrification. These, it's these type of these type of policies that are actually defeated. So, anyway, we got a, we got about a minute left. Elon Musk this weekend seemed to have taken a libertarian turn. What do you guys think? We got about a minute left or so, maybe two. Go, John. No, well, I'm no. I thought Richard would have a lot to say about this. I I don't know if my thoughts are organized, but I'll try. So Elon. Uh, has been a great beneficiary of uh, of government largesse, and um, and and uh, has. I don't know if he's that cynical or what, but uh, you know he's pretty much came out and and did a rant against the the Build Back Better and the infrastructure and all the rest of that. And he used he coined some very nice phrases. He talked about uh, you know government regulation basically basically being hardening of the arteries that 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 kills the economy the government needs to get out of the way and and stop supporting certain industries to the advantage of others and it's strange that it happened right apparently and i didn't know this part of the build back better or one of the scam bills they've passed says that uh, every electric car gets a seventy five hundred dollar uh, federal tax credit but if it's produced in a union plant and oh, by the way, Tesla is not union. It gets an additional forty-five hundred dollar tax credit, and it seems his his timing seems a little bit. Suspect. Yeah, I mean he's talking his own book, but it's interesting. I, I you know I think probably Elon Musk is a libertarian at heart, but uh, if government's going to throw money at him, he's going to take it. Yeah. And I can't, I, you know, I don't blame him for that. I really don't. No, I I, I do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, we got to get our tax money back somehow or another, yeah. uh, hopefully. And uh, but the interesting thing that I thought he said was that uh, I, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not going to get the quote, <laughs> right, but something along the lines of government is a monopoly and it's the only monopoly that has the power of force behind it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's straight out of the anarchist playbook. I mean, that's 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 radical, but it's true. And uh, uh, well, you know, time is the force. He's also been to- named. He's also been named Man of the Year by Time Magazine. So yeah. I don't know what the hell that means, but it's got to mean it's, it's got to be means we're out of time. We have guys to go. Thank you guys for being here with us this week. Thank you all for watching us and see you next week. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show in Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast, each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty.